So this is Apple's Mac Studio, and this one is running their M1 Ultra chip, their most powerful processor. And of all the systems I've ever had in this studio, this is the fastest one for the stuff that I do. It's faster than any PC I've built. It's faster than any Apple system I've had in here. It's super powerful, but it's so over the top. It's like overkill for the vast majority of people, including myself. But that being said, having seen what this thing does, I'm so tempted to get one. It came in a pretty small box. It had a handle on it, like many of Apple's heavier devices, and it opens up a little differently, like maybe because of its weight, but they use the sides of the boxes to help leverage it out of the packaging. It's pretty cool. And inside you get the Mac Studio itself, a power cable and some paperwork, and of course you get the ultimate badge of pro Apple users, the black Apple sticker. Now, this device is pretty heavy. It comes in at just over three and a half kilograms, and it, most of that weight is like, towards the back of the device. So I think it's because of the heat sink. It's like a pretty extensive thermal system in the back and it's a huge copper heat sink on the Ultra model. And it's like this, when you lift it up, it's like there's junk in the trunk. It's got some heft to the back of the device. The M1 Max configured ones supposedly have an aluminum heat sink. So they're not as heavy as the copper heat sink equipped Ultra versions, but they're probably back heavy as well. Now in terms of its size, it's got the same kind of footprint as the Mac mini. Uh, so 7.7 .7 by 7.7 .7 inches, but this one's just a little bit taller and obviously heavier. And I say a little bit, but it's like, a couple inches taller, it's noticeably taller, but this is still super, super compact for this type of system. I actually don't think there's any other company that's ever tried to make something this powerful in a chassis this size. It's really special in that sense. The port selection is really good on the Mac Studio. There's six USB-C and all of them support Thunderbolt on the M1 Ultra equipped version. There's ethernet in the back and the HDMI port back there is only HDMI 2.0. It's a bit of a miss I feel on a studio device like this. That's like a high end powerful device. I feel like there are a good number of users that would want a high refresh, high resolution display coming out of that port, but it can't. There's a rear mounted audio jack and then a power button that's on the curved portion of the back there. And then up front you have your fast SD card reader. Now the rear of this device is taken up with a huge exhaust. Like this is the vast majority of the rear of the device. And they've even drilled holes along the curved part of the frame just to maximize the airflow that comes out of this thing. The bottom of the device is where the air intake is. And once again, it's heavily perforated, but there isn't an easy way to access this device. Like on the Mac mini, this is where you'd pop out and get into it. But this is a review unit. I don't feel comfortable like prying at it. There doesn't seem to be a simple way to get in here. And we'll talk about repairability in a minute, but this is not easy to get into. I don't know where I'd even start. Like maybe through the Kensington lock, you gotta like poke something in there and like pry it open, but that doesn't make sense. I don't know. Okay, in addition to the Mac Studio, I was also sent the Studio Display and this unboxes like an iMac. You lay it down flat. One thing I noticed though when I pulled it out is that the power cable comes attached to the monitor and it seems really stuck into the display. Like I'm not even sure if it's detachable. I pulled on it pretty hard, but because it's a review unit, I don't wanna break it, but it seems really unlikely that you wouldn't be able to remove the cable. So I plugged everything up and I ran some benchmarks and the M1 Ultra does really well in Cinebench and Geekbench. Like the M1 performance just scales so well. With M1 Ultra, you really do seem to be able to get double the performance of M1 Max when it comes to synthetic benchmarks. And same with GPU performance. It benchmarks really well, but it will depend on the application as to how well you can utilize that hardware. So let's start off here. This is the 12th gen Intel system I recently built. It's faster than the AMD system I built last year. It's obviously faster than any laptop I've ever had, including the M1 Max MacBook Pro but the M1 Ultra is on a whole different level. And most of the main apps I use from the Adobe Suite perform very well on this system, which is kind of strange because when it comes to Apple products, they usually synergize best with Apple software like Final Cut and Logic, but yeah, I'll take it. So I've only been able to use this system for a few days and I've only been able to test a handful of workflows, but I also tested out Blender. Now, Blender was recently updated to 3.1 where it now supports Metal GPU rendering. And from my tests, the M1 Ultra is faster than the Max, but it can't even come close to what the NVIDIA RTX cards can do over there. Uh, there is one thing to keep in mind. Now, as cool as all this stuff sounds, a lot of apps and a lot of components or effects in apps lean very heavily on single-threaded performance still. And this system has good single-threaded performance, but so did the M1 Max and so does the M1 Pro. So it's like, you know, stuff like the viewport in Blender or like giant Photoshop files. Like if they performed poorly or like not great, with other systems that you know had good uh, single-threaded performance already, it doesn't get better with 
the M1 Ultra product. It's just single threaded performance is just the way it is. Um, okay, the thermal characteristics of this device doesn't get hot, doesn't get loud. And it's so strange to me that a system like this can have performance of this caliber and maintain the noise level and energy consumption and heat output that this does. And it's so hard to stress in a video like this. Right? And people, some people just straight up don't care. They don't care if their systems are like, you know, 60 decibels and they pull out 1500 watts. Some people don't care. I do. And when I look at this, I'm like, my goodness, like this is an engineering marvel because no one else has done this. Like literally no one else has even come close to having this kind of performance and to have it scale so well and yet maintain the energy profile that this thing does. It's very impressive. Okay, uh, I need to move this conversation over to the display and we'll come back to the kind of the two. But the display, when I first heard about it at the kind of presentation, I thought $1,600 for that, it's overpriced. It's a 5K panel, but it's not bright enough for HDR. There's no 120 Hertz ProMotion. There's no Face ID hardware. So when I looked at it, it's like, there's so many good 4K panels out there with that kind of size. Like, unless you're really looking for a 5K panel, it seemed like not a great deal. Now, having getting it in, I don't think my opinion has changed too much, but there is an argument to be made that if you're looking for something like this, there's nothing else on the market. And I guess when you have that monopoly and you're like the only person supplying this specific thing, you can charge whatever you want, right? So with this panel, I don't really think that the difference between 5K and 4K panels are visually distinguishable, at least to me, like at a 27 inch panel size, like you gotta be going right up to the panel to be like, okay, this is the 5K one, right? So a good 4K panel to me looks just as good as this one. However, the aesthetic of it is quite unique. The aluminum stand seems really well made. It seems like a much sturdier product than the LG display that Apple used to sell. And the nano texture coating, this is an option that I'd personally skip unless you have no way of controlling your light sources. Like it'll help to diffuse direct light, but it does soften up the image quite a bit. And there's also braided cabling that comes with the product for connecting everything up. If you're connecting it up to a laptop, you get 96 watt power delivery. Uh, but if you're connecting it right up to the Mac Studio, everything looks super clean. There's an A13 Bionic chip that's inside the display and it's supposed to help with audio processing and image processing for the webcam. I don't know how useful it is, but it seems legit. Like when I first connected it up, it needed to download a 600 meg update, like a firmware update for the display. And I'm assuming it's firmware updating that chip as if it's like a phone. There must be like storage inside that display actually. It is strangely thick to me though. Like it's not running super bright LEDs in there. And when you look at their 24 inch iMac, like the M1 iMac, like they can put that whole computer and that whole panel into something super thin. This thing doesn't really need to be that thick. Now it does have a center stage capable webcam, which is cool and all, but I don't think they need the thickness. The speakers, however, maybe that's why. So they sound really nice but not everyone wants to pay extra for speakers built into the display. Also, in case you're wondering, there is a basic speaker inside the Mac Studio itself. Uh, okay, I wanna talk about value overall for this product. So this, it starts at $2,000 for like the base entry level with M1 Max, and then if you want the Ultra, it goes up to 4,000, I believe. I think this is a appropriately priced product. Like for the person who's looking at this for, to better their workflow or their business with like, better performance with multi-core processing capabilities. This is, it's a really good system. There is, however, seemingly no way to upgrade the Mac Studio, which I think is terrible for a desktop system, but that's just the way Apple's computing products have been for the past little bit. Uh, again, I've said this in multiple videos, but like these are just tools, right? If you're looking at this like, I want that thing, that's so cool, but I don't know what I'd use it for. Don't get this, man. Like it's just, it's, Apple's gonna market this thing so well, I know you're gonna want it but if you have a clear use for it, it's a good one. Now, the decision that I think some people might have is like between, between this or their laptops. And if you want like the ultra, like the best possible performance and you have the cash for it, like obviously this is the only place you can get the ultra right now. Uh, whether they drop it into their laptop, that's a whole different conversation. My guess is yes, they do it, but it'll be gimped slightly. That's, that's my guess. Uh, but it won't be anytime soon if they ever do it. Uh, but in terms of the M1 Max laptop versus the M1 Max desktop, like obviously you're gonna know way better than anyone else that you asked this question to, like the person asking the question. But I will say that this system is somewhat portable. Like it's 
heavy, but it's not like huge, right? You could just stuff it in a bag as you have like two power cables, two sets of keyboards and mice, and like two monitors. You just like bring it back and forth between your work and your home or whatever. I'm just saying, it's a pretty cool system. Okay, there you have it. The Mac Studio and the Mac Studio Display. Okay, hope you guys enjoyed this video. Thumbs if you liked it, subs if you loved it. I'll see you guys next time.